Hello everyone, welcome back to Bioholic. This is your bioeducator Unkita Vishwas. Hope you all are doing well. So today, after the bryophytes, we are going to talk about the second most diverse land plants of plant kingdom, which is pteridophytes. Okay. Now before jump into this video, I want to remind you after watching the full video, make sure you check the description box below because there is a link of today's self assessment test now let's begin so let's start with the term pteridophytes greek word pteron means feather and phyton means plants so the word pteridophytes literally means the plants with feather like fronds or fronds okay now these plants are flowerless seedless and spore producing vascular plant which have successfully invaded the land okay now the pteridophytes represents an intermediate position between the bryophytes and spermatophytes or you can say the gymnosperm and angiosperm and it was classified under the class cryptogamia by Carolus Linnaeus in 1754 so that it is also called as vascular cryptogam okay now i will talk about the characteristic features of the pteridophytes so at first the pteridophytes include the hostels and ferns okay and evolutionarily they are the first terrestrial plants to possess the vascular tissues the xylem and phloem Now the pteridophytes are found mainly in cool, damp, and shady places. Although you can see them in also the sandy soil conditions. Okay. Now in pteridophytes, the main plant body is a sporophyte, which is differentiated into true root, stem, and leaves. And these organs possess well differentiated vascular tissues, like I have said that xylem and phloem. Okay. Now the leaves in the pteridophyte are small as in the selaginilia or large as in ferns okay now the sporophytes bear sporangia and which are subtended by the leafy like appendages which are also known as sporophylls okay now in some cases sporophylls may form the distinct compact structure which is also known as strobili or cones okay and this sporangia produces the spores by meiosis in spore mother cells okay now the spores germinate to give rise to the inconspicuous small but multicellular free living and mostly photosynthetic thalloid gametophytes which is also known as prothallus okay now these gametophytes require cool damp and shady places to grow and because of this specific restricted requirement the need for the water for fertilization in the spread of the living pteridophytes is very limited and they are restricted to narrow geographical regions okay now let's have a look into its reproduction so the gametes of pteridophytes bear male and female sex organs known as antheridia and archegonia okay now the water is required for the transfer of anthozoites the male gametes released from the antheridia to the mouth of the archegonium now the fusion of the male gamete with the egg present in the archegonium result in the formation of zygote okay next the zygote thereafter produces a multicellular well differentiated sporophyte okay the sporophyte is the dominant phase of the pteridophytes okay now one thing is in majority of the pteridophytes all the spores are of similar kinds okay 
and such plants are called as homosporous. But in some cases like the genera like Silagenilia or the Salvania which produces two kinds of spores like the macrospores or microspores they are known as heterospores. Okay. Now let's come to the point after the formation of sporophyte the megaspores and microspores germinate and give rise to the female and male gametophytes okay now the female gametophytes in these plants are retained on the parent sporophytes for the variable periods and the development of the zygotes into the young embryos takes place within the female gametophytes okay and this event is a precursor to the seed habit considered as an important step in their evolution fine now as i have said before that the teredophytes are the intermediate between the bryophytes and spermatophytes so obviously they have some similarities between them so today we will only learn about the similarities with the bryophytes and next year we will talk about the similarities with the spermatophytes okay so let's see so both of the plants or the bryophytes and teredophytes have terrestrial mode of life in both cases water is very much important for the process of fertilization and their male gametes are flagellated the structure and ontogeny of the sex organs of both the bryophytes and teredophytes are based on similar pattern both the groups have definite alterations of sporophytic and gametophytic generations their sexual reproduction is of oogamous type and obviously the zygote is retained within the venture of the archegonium to form their embryo okay and the sex organs are surrounded by the sterile jacket and the young sporophyte is partially or wholly dependent on the gametophyte for their nourishment okay so next is the classification of teredophytes so oswald and tipo in 1942 classified the teredophytes into four subphyla which are the Cilopsida, Lycopsida, Spinopsida, and Teropsida. Okay, and we will talk about each of them one by one. So at first, the subphylum Cilopsida, which are the oldest known vascular plants, and most of them now are fossils. Okay, their plant body is relatively less differentiated. Their roots are absent, and instead, they have dichotomously branched rhizome. their aerial axis is either naked or have some smaller spirally arranged leaves their sporangia are calling meaning they are directly born on the axis or stem and their lateral or terminal in position okay now examples are cilotum and mesipteris okay now next is the lycopsida So the plant body of the lycopsida is differentiated into root, stem and leaves, okay? Now their leaves are small with a single unbranched vein and they so that their leaves are known as microphyllous, okay? Now their sporangia develop into the axil of the sporophylls, okay? Now these sporophylls generally form the compact strobili, okay? and their examples include lycopodium silagenilia okay next is the subphylum spinopsida okay so in spinopsida their stem differentiated into nodes and internodes their leaves are microphyllous which is present in rolls at the each node okay and their sporangia are borne with the sporangia sporangia force which form the compact cones at the apex of the fertile branches okay and the example of sphenopsida is equisetum okay and finally the teropsida 
So in Pteroxida, the plant body is well differentiated into root, stem and leaves. And their leaves are megaphyllous and pinnately compound. Okay. Now the sporangia develop on the ventral surface of the sporophylls, usually aggregated into sori or the spore producing receptacles. Okay. And the examples are diopteris, teres, etc. Now after the classification, there is economic importance of the pteridophytes. So at first, the medicines. So an anthelmintic drug is obtained from the rhizomes of the fern dryopteris. Also the lycopodium is used as a medicine of skin diseases. Okay. Next is food. So the sporocarps of the marsilia are rich source of starch and it is used by the tribals for their nutritive value. Third one is the soil conservation. So pteridophytes bind the soil even along with the hill slopes. So the soil is protected from the erosion. And finally the ornamental value. So many ferns are grown as ornamental plants in the gardens for their large, delicate and graceful foliage like the lycopodium, Silagenilia, Anemia, etc. Okay? So now if you have any questions or doubts related to today's lecture, then ask me in the comment section below. And if you want to do your self-assessment test, then go and check the link in the description box below. And if you find this video helpful, then give it a big thumbs up and share it with others. And if you are new here, then hi myself, Onkita Bishash, your bioeducator. Please subscribe to our channel Bioholic and press the bell icon to get further notifications of our upcoming videos. So that's all for today. We will meet on next Wednesday. Till then, take care and keep watching Bioholic.